icon. In doing so, he's also become the world's digital public intellectual. Uh, but Chris is more than just an observer, he's also a creator. Uh, his best-selling book, The Long Tail, has not only changed our thinking on matters digital, but completely transformed the way that we think of both retail and marketing. And obviously we at MDC believe that consumers consume influence very differently in a digital economy and people like Chris have really been leading that way. Um, one of the uh, most important things about Chris is he's taken another leap and that's to push the digital culture along a better, clearer and more forward-looking path. Um, in the book he shows us just how intuitive it is to seemingly counterintuitive aspects of today's digital marketplace. It's been quite controversial because not everybody in the traditional media has embraced this change, uh, but obviously we do embrace it because we fundamentally believe that uh, you need to think like an insurgent, not like an incumbent, and you have to challenge status quo, which is obviously what Chris has been very successful at doing. Um, we. Uh, feel very privileged to have Chris and to be the first official book launch. We didn't know how successful it would be, but we were thrilled that we got four times the kind of um, interest in the book, and I think it's indicative of not only um, the interest in the areas that Chris has covered in both The Long Tail and Now Free, but the kind of thought leadership that Chris has become world renowned for. So it really is our privilege and our pleasure uh, to have you here and to have Chris with us and he will share with you uh, some of his views and have some informal Q&A but it's really a pleasure so without further ado it's a privilege to introduce Chris Anderson. Thank you. Uh, Miles, uh, first uh, thank you for your generosity um, and um, I think your fundamental philosophical alignment, I mean, these, these, are, these are really interesting times in all senses of the word. We are seeing industries in in disarray, we're seeing industries being being reformed. Um, we don't know anything. We uh, all of our assumptions about about see, they were built in the 20th century, you know, um, you know, monopoly model that we all benefited from are being challenged, and we've got to grope our way through the dark into something new and exciting. Um, it doesn't always feel exciting; it often feels really scary and threatening. Um, but I just want to thank you for for recognizing that these that, that that this conversation is the conversation to have right now and. I don't know whether you realize how notorious uh, you know free would be, but but in a sense it was predictable. Free is perhaps the most misunderstood word in the English language, um, and this is what's come to me. This is really what drove the book. Um, you know, a simple word, free, one that we feel we understand so well, um, has not only turned out to be more complicated than we thought, but is changing in meaning. And uh, you know, when I when I came to the the the, the, the 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 book, the original the original driving force was recognizing that around us we have built. An economy, and a country-sized economy with a default price is zero, and yet that challenges everything we've been trained. We've been told there's no such thing as a free lunch. We've been told that you get what you pay for. We've been told you can't make money from free, that it's a trick, that it's a scam, and yet we've built a you know, country-sized economy based on that price. There's something, there's something that's changed. And as I, you know, well, I, I, when I, you know I, I always test all my ideas off my children. Usually I, t I test my magazine covers off my wife. Don't tell my, my staff that. And I test my, my, my ideas off my children. And I say to my kids, um, Daddy's writing a book about, about this weird thing about, how, you can, you know, about how, how things online can be free and about how that's okay and about how you can make money. And they're like, you're kidding. The kids are like, duh. <laughs> of course, you know, things are online for free because it doesn't cost anything. I'm like, oh, wow, you knew that? And they're like, don't you have an iPhone? You know, iPhone app's free. And I'm like, okay. And then you talk to other people, and they're like, no way. Are you an idiot? Of course this is a scam. You know, we've, we, we know there's no such thing as a free lunch. We, re, we know you can't build a business model on free. We know you can't compete with free. Come on. You know, don't you know Econ 101? And in that paradox, in, you know, between duh and no way, lies, <laughs> lies, lies something very interesting. And I think what we're realizing is that, is that free, this word, which was always confusing, you know, are we talking about free as in free speech or free as in no price? Is it Libra or is it gratis? Is it, is it free, that, 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 that trick that we've been using for a hundred years, starting with, you know, as you'll see from the book, Jello, actually predated King Gillette and the razor and blade model. Um, you know, 
buy one, get one free isn't really free. Razors and blades, you're still paying. It's a trick. You know, we're rightly suspicious, and yet we're, un we're, we're endlessly drawn to it. You know, in the same way, our psychology of price is incredibly confused. Why does two ninety nine work? You know, we've been to college. Right? Yeah, you know, we should two ninety nine shouldn't work, and it does. Why does free work when we know that that the free gift inside is not really free? And the answer is that this has a power over us that 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 we can't deny. And then, but then it wasn't a new economic model. Then it was simply a psychology. Then it was just marketing. And what happened in a subtle way over the last ten years is that is that it went from a trick to a real economic model. That that that. Once things went online, and it went from the inflationary world of atoms, where everything got more expensive and you had to trick people, it had to be a cross-subsidy, it had to be direct payments, sooner or later you're paying, to one where 95% of the people could really get the product for free, that Google doesn't show up in your credit card, that, 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 that the marginal cost of production fell to zero and, and then kept falling and kept falling and kept falling. The deflationary world that we've inherited, this created a new form of free, a form of free that wasn't a trick, but it's also not clear whether it's a business. You know, what, what are the business models around free? Is it just applying, you know, slapping ads against it and you know monetizing eyeballs? Is it is it the first 21st century business model, which is freemium, which is really what the book is about? Is it is it um, you know how much of this is real and how much of this is is ephemeral, a momentary, um, you know, a bubble? We, we, we don't know, but what we do know is that, is that a generation has grown up um, adopting free, that the, that the, that the, that the medium, the, the marketplace on which we all compete today is one where the force of gravity is, is inextricably tra taking prices to zero, and it's our job to figure out how to turn this into a business, how to, how to, how to turn free from a trick into the foundations of, 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 of a new industry. And you know the best example is YouTube. Um, you know, controversially, you know, YouTube, which is the, sort of the poster child of free, and also the poster child of losing hundreds of millions of dollars on free. <laughs> um, you know, what's the problem with YouTube? Um, there's no problem from a consumer perspective. It's free. We love it. There's, um, you know, the underlying economics. You know, what they need to cost 0.25 cents, 0.025 cents to stream a 10-minute video today. It'll cost half that much in a year, and half that much again in a year on. We can see the trend lines are all going to zero, and yet Google still manages to lose quite a lot of money. What's the problem here? The problem is that we have not figured out how to create an advertising form that suits YouTube. We created a medium that suits the small as well as the large. We create a medium that allows everybody to create content. We create a medium that creates the richest video content on, that we've ever seen, a medium that allows you know, um, uh, uh, every filmmaker who can be a filmmaker will be a filmmaker. Every film that can be a film will be a film. The, we will reinvent, we will create the future of television collectively on YouTube because it's free. It's free as in Libra, it's free as in gratis. It's open and costs nothing. And yet, turning it into a business is going to take people in this room. It's going to take people like you. It's going to, it's going to take, um, you, know, uh, you know, the traditional skills of media and advertising to figure out what is this new form of, of, of content, this new form of marketing, this new form of, of, of communicating with consumers that actually makes money, that actually, that actually scales to the niche, that scales to the narrow, that scales to the specific in the way that the medium does. So um, I'm afraid I don't have the answers. I know. <laughs> now, the, the book has many cases, many, 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 uh, many rules to live by, some general principles, some case studies, lots and lots of case studies. Some people have solved individual problems, but there is no one answer. You know, there is no there is no secret formula for free. Every one of us is going to have to figure it out ourselves. We're all going to have to learn how to compete with free. We're going to have to learn how to how to how to use free. We're going to have to learn out what the, what, the, what our premium is in the premium equation. Um, my mine in, in my book is to give away the book for free and um, right. <laughs> no, it's, it's 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 a little more it's a little more more subtle than that. But we believe in books. We believe that the physical book would still make sense in an internet age. We believe that the physical book, the hardcover, is the premium in the premium equation, and we're willing to, to, to act on this by giving the book away digitally in, in, in e-books and audio books and taking a really scary leap. And I, I, I should say, uh, thanks will come in a moment, but I should say that my publisher on this is not, you know, O'Reilly or some radical technology publisher. My publisher on this is Disney, Hyperion. Um, the fact that Disney would take a chance on a book called Free and be willing to put it online for free um, 
And, you know, for me, it's easy. You know, it's, it's like, you know, it's all, you know, I'll make monetary currency, I'll make reputation currency, it's all a win. Hyperion sells books. We're betting that free digital books will sell, will sell, will sell paid physical books. We believe in the book. And, but this is a real test. Um, and, and, it's, and it's, you know, today we launched the ebook edition on script. Um, it was downloaded by 25,000 people just today. How many of them are going to buy the physical book? Um, how is this going to turn into money? We don't know. Um, but I do promise in the next three months, we'll tell you how it went. And we'll tell you how this experiment went. And the learning from this, which we're collectively all doing in, the, in our own ways, is going to be something that's going to dictate what the, what the business model of the 21st century really will be. So um, a, a few things. First of all, Miles, th thank you again for, for, for doing this and, um, and for believing that, that uh, scary ideas propagated widely are a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, I want to thank my team, the team at Hyperion, um, uh, Will, Will Balliot, Will Schwabe, my, my, my editor, um, Brandon, uh, uh, Christine. Um, you, this team believed this was an experiment worth doing. It was an idea worth propagating. And um, I believe all press is good press. Just keep saying that. All press. <laughs> <laughs> and, and MDC believed in contributing its fair share. Because, so, so we wanted to make sure that all of you got an autographed copy for free. So it's not true that physical books don't come for free. They actually do. And here you've got autographed copies that you can get for free on the way there. But no, we think it's terrific. And uh, we, we, we just think that this kind of thought leadership and challenging you know, conventional wisdom is really very important. And um, we think it'll be a great commercial success. So anyway, with, with, with that said, uh, plenty of other people to think about. Just, uh, just say thank you all for coming. And um, I think we should take a few questions. Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, um, I, you know Free threat or menace? <laughs> That's usually the, 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 the tenor. Uh, did, did um, you know we're here in the middle of the media industry where free is considered a um, is considered a you know we're demonetizing industry. It's Craigslist. You know it's free classifieds. Yes. Right. I'll, I'll repeat the question. Uh, this is the question of, uh, it's, it's free in money, but is it free in time? What about the opportunity cost of time? I mean, I think what we're seeing right here is, you know, we've talked a lot, we use this metaphor of the attention economy, the reputation economy. Um, what we're seeing here is that things are free in the monetary economy, but very much not free in these other economies. Um, you know, you are paying with your time, you're paying with your reputation with, you know, when, 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 you, when you follow something and talk about it. Um, what's really profound about the last 10 years is that we've taken these, these, these non-monetary economies, these social, these social and reputational things, and we've turned them into a real economy. So in the old days, you do things for your family. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't charge your family members for service and gender, right? You do lots of things for each other for non-monetary reasons, for reputational reasons. Now for the first time, we're doing them in public. We are doing them on a global stage, and, and, these, and, these, and these acts, these services, these content, these, 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 these intellectual gifts that were traditionally given between tight groups of social and social ties within family members and communities are now being done globally and competing with the monetary economy. So we now have the kind of globalization of the non-monetary economy. At the same time, we see the, the, the measurability of the non-monetary economy. We can now very precisely measure reputation. And there isn't one reputation economy. There's the Facebook economy. There's the there's the Twitter fo followers. There's your there's your, your there's, there's the page rank and, and links. There is there is the, in every video game online. There's gold and reputation, and experience. There's status. All these things are highly measurable, and they all have value. But we're trying to figure out how to convert that value to cash. And then there's the attention economy, which was once basically you're here, I have your attention. But is now we're online, we have traffic. You know, that attention is now global. Once again, it has value and we're trying to measure it. So, you know, the recognition that, that these non-monetary economies can be as powerful as the monetary economy, that, that people will do things for reputation that are often even better than what they'll do for cash. The recognition that you don't, that the money is not the only thing that makes the world go around, is, is very much the story of this book. And your question is, what about the reputational cost? What about the attention cost? That's exactly that's exactly what this is about. The rise of the non-monetary economies that are free in cash, but not free in terms of these other things that are scarce and valuable, and how to turn that into something that you can you can make you build a business on is very much the story of the book and, 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 and the theme for the next decade. Any other? Uh, uh, there's, a, there's one back there. Oh yes, sorry. Is it not the 
for monetizing ultimately when the freeness is quantified? Um, the, the question is, 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 is the freeness quantified? Once it's quantified, right. is this not a model for making monetization happen? Right. You know, I mean, we, we end up with these more paradoxes. You know, how, what is the size of the free economy if you can't measure it in dollars, of cent, dollars and cents? Um, you know, I, 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 think, I think, you know, the, um, I mean, just to sort of repeat the, 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 the last question, when you stop keeping score with money, what do you keep score with? You know, what are these new reputational credits? What are these new attention credits? What is, what is, what is you know, how do we value what we do? How do we record what people think of what we do when we're not keeping score with dollars and cents anymore? Um, I think we all do it in our own way. Um, you know, attention is something we've, we've always monetized, but now it's taken to a global scale, and um, and you know that is the trick: converting from one from non-monetary to monetary economies. I realize that sounds really wonky, but um, that's uh, that's our job. That's what we'll figure out over the next decade. Back there, yes, sir. John, uh, hi. Hey. <laughs> Um, so, as a nerd, I was, you know, my, my post question when I saw the nerd fight erupt in the case of New York, I went not that well. Yeah. Uh, right after you. Um, now, I'm in the position of having to A, summarize his arguments that I read right before I fell asleep, and your arguments in a book that I haven't yet read. So, let me, let me just sort of take a tiny piece of what Malcolm said in that test. Um, there are a great deal of examples in the marketplace that indicate that a lot of information wants to be very expensive. There's the obvious thing, like subscriptions to Wall Street Journal. There's all sorts of database services. People have made a lot of money off information that people want to pay a lot of money for. So, I mean, at the minimum, we have a tiering of your argument, or at the outset, right. you're basically completely freaking wrong. Which one is it? <laughs> it's the former. So, what you will discover with your free book is that, um, is that, is that you, know, you can imagine a really bad, stupid book called Free. And this really bad, stupid book called Free would say, hey, information wants to be free, man. Everything should be free. Um, you know, the pirates run riots. You know, get over it. Uh, fortunately, I didn't write that book. <laughs> um, the, but that's what not come out of Well, you know, my esteemed the Condé Nast colleague. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I, would, I, would, I would, I would, wouldn't All differ with him. But he, he, he does, he does come from a somewhat media-centric perspective. Uh, perspective, I use that phrase uh, advisedly. Uh, the column title, the column. Um, uh, So here's what Stuart Brand did say. Um, in that famous quote, information wants to be free. He said, some information wants to be free because the cost of, of creating information is zero. And some information wants to be really expensive because the value to you is, 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 is infinite. And, and this is what we're seeing. This, 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 is, this is not a world where everything's going to be free. It's going to be a world where free is one of the prices out there. And your question is not can you stop it from being free, but can you do something else that people will pay for? The, 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 the business model is not is not free, it's freemium. It is, you know, the free is a given. That's the force of gravity. That's just what digital economics require. If you don't do it, someone else will do it to you. The question is, what's your premium? You know, what's the thing you're going to charge more for? I mean, the Radiohead example is a perfect one. You know, rather, the, the music industry sort of said, we're charging, we have three prices. We have, we have, you know, radio, which I suppose is free. We have the album, we have the single, and then we have the tour. And Radiohead says, okay, well, what if we had, like, every price possible? What if we, like, you name your own price, and those prices went all the way up to $110 for the box set, and then $150 for front row seats at, you know, Wembley Stadium? You know, what if we, what if we uh, actually go, you know, spend a little time and try to figure out how to target every aspect of the audience? There's the, there's the casual, there's the sort of, you know, fan, there's the intense fan, there's the incredibly obsessed crazy fan, I never want to meet them guy. <laughs> and you know, we have a product for every one of them. And so the question is not the question is not what are we gonna do about free? It's <coughs> given. We're gonna continue doing you know, using free for what's good for, which is which is marketing, for, for for spreading the message to get the maximum possible audience. The question is once you've established that maximum audience, once you've once you've introduced your what you're doing to the largest number of people, who are the people who will pay more? You know, we in the magazine industry, we have zero dollars, that's our websites, we have five dollars on the newsstands, and we have 80 cents per issue, which is the magazine model, ten dollars a year, whatever. What's our twenty dollar model? What's our thirty dollar model? What's our hundred and thirty dollar model? I mean, I know this is somewhat controversial because the Washington Post just found their twenty-five thousand dollar model. <laughs> 
And, and you can you can argue that that wasn't exactly the right answer. But the, right question, the right question is what's our twenty five thousand dollar model that doesn't get us in trouble? So 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 free is, is vastly misunderstood as everything's going to be free, man. And uh, although I live in Berkeley, I don't, I, I, you know, I, I drive an SUV mostly to annoy my neighbors. And, and I'm, not saying, I'm not saying, hey man, everything should be free. I'm saying, hey man, free is the force of gravity. Free is the, is, is the price you're going to deal with. How do you find a way to charge more in a world where free does what it's best at, which is to introduce your, your, your products to the largest audience? And also Malcolm's wrong in all of the ways. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can, can the media industry figure out what that premium model is before the legacy cost structure bring all of shit down? Oh my. <laughs> um, so we, we, we have a problem. So the, the newspaper industry right now thinks that free is the enemy. You know, the newspaper industry has, has three problems, right? Uh, and, you know, the first problem is is we have, you know, we, I say we, I'm, I'm, traditional media had a monopoly in the 20th century. We owned the factories, we owned the trucks, we owned the distribution. We lost our monopoly. So the first problem is competition. Um, newspapers in particular, the second problem is Craigslist. And the third problem is this inconvenient recession, which, you know, happened. And it's, it's re you know, revealed, as they say, when the, when the tide goes down, it's, you know, you can see who's not wearing shorts. Um, so, so those are the three problems. Um, free is actually not the problem. Free wasn't a choice. It was not. It wasn't an option. We could. It wasn't. A, it wasn't. It wasn't something we could decide to do. You know, had we, had you know, we the media folks gotten together in a room like this ten years ago and said, paywall, yeah, let's just all agree to keep our paywalls up, the outcome would not have been different. You know, ultimately the competition was the problem, which is other people who were not in this room would have gone to free, and 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 brought the price down there. So the problem, so so the um, uh, so 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 free was a given. Free is the force of gravity, and the question is is you know our problem is, is fundamentally our cost structure. We have we have we have we have decided we've we've gone from a world of one hundred and twenty dollars CPMs to a world of like five dollars CPMs, and our cost structure hasn't fallen accordingly. So we need to bring the cost structure down. At the same time, we need to bring the uh, CPMs up. And I think that's the question for for, for you, um, Miles. <laughs> how am I? How are we going to get back to 120 dollars CPMs so that we can continue making stuff that people love while still paying uh, for for content creation and all the other things that that the traditional media model did, did so well? That wasn't rhetorical. Uh, <laughs> you got the wrong guy for the answer. I'm going to take your line. I don't have any answers. <laughs> Anyway, that's the, that, 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 that's the question. We need to do both. We need to bring the costs down, and we need to find a way to start to, you know, to find a way to get past $5 a day. We need to invent a form of advertising that is as effective as our form of content in this new world where everybody, everybody has access to the consumer, and you have to win by on the merits of what you do. But on, on, on a tangential question to David's is, how patient will investors be in free media? How much money are they prepared to lose for what period of time will venture capitalists before they say we need to ultimately get a return? In other words, do you yeah. see that this is a two year or a three year or a five year or a ten year sort of window by which they say, I know that we're getting eyeballs, I know that it's great for the consumer, and we'll figure out a business model over time, that the world will unfold the way it should, as Mr. Trudeau used to say? I work for a privately held company. That's a good thing. In these, in these days. I mean, you really don't want to have venture capital investors right now. You really don't want to be a public company right now, because you're absolutely right. Um, we don't have, we don't have... <laughs> All those present excluded. Well, I mean, you, you don't, it, this is not a problem, this is not a solution. We're not going to come up with a solution in the next quarter. We're not going to come up with solutions in the next four quarters. I mean, this is, this is a sort of a once in a lifetime, you know, uh, industrial reshaping. And it's going to take a while to get it right. And, and you know, my, my biggest worry is not that the venture capitalists are going to get impatient or that the market's going to get impatient. My biggest worry is that as we, as we destroy one industry and rebuild another, um, the usual vehicles of Chapter 11, that is access to credit, are not available. It's, a, it's very, very bad timing this is happening as we have a credit crisis. And I worry that we're going to break, it's going to get worse before it gets, gets better. I worry that we're going to break some really valuable and important things before we can rebuild them under a new form. And so I'm, 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 I'm worried. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, those those who think that I'm, I'm a champion of the the destructive forces of free are, are wrong. I'm 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 aware and realistic that free is an inevitability. 
but I'm worried about what it's going to do to things that we value in the short term. And I th find the fact that it's happening in time of limited capital and um, limited patience to be to be a concern. Um, I hope we don't lose all of America's newspapers. Um, I suspect we will lose some of America's newspapers. I hope we have enough time to figure it out. Any other? I'll take one last question. Um, do you only see uh, an advertising model, or how about charging? No, 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 no. Sorry. And, and again, another huge misunderstanding of, 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 of the book. Um, it's not about advertising. Is actually the least interesting model. Um, advertising uh, was the sort of superposition of the last, the last model of free. So, so 20th century free was a little bit of a, a, a bakery in, in marketing, and then the media model, which is radio is free to air, television is free to air. We, it's called, in, in economics, it's called a two-sided market. One side gets it for free, that's producers give to consumers for free, and then the other side, advertisers subsidize it by buying the audience. Um, in the first wave of the internet, we just sort of took that, that, that model of free, and we just, opposed, we just imposed it. Build an audience, throw ads against it, you know, hope for the best. Um, that took us to, you know, to the top com bubble. Then we restarted it, and that took us to September of last year. Um, now we need to now we need to invent a new model, and that's freemium. And most of the book is actually about freemium, which is again um, using you know ninety percent free, eighty percent free. Most people get it for free, but a minority pays. They pay directly. They pay you know credit card. They pay a lot. I think they pay for the right reasons, which is not that they were seduced by marketing messages, but that they tried it, they loved it, they wanted more. And that, I think, is that's the first 21st century um, in a business model. And, and the book is really about freemium, where, which, is, which is the first really free model for most people, but still results in direct revenues. You're being paid for what you do. And you see that for newspapers? I think the Wall Street Journal is a great example of, of, of freemium. People wrongly characterize the Wall Street Journal and Murdoch as sort of free versus paid. It, it is not free versus paid. Uh, it is free versus freemium. The Wall Street Journal gives away a lot of content for free. They'll probably give more content away for free, um, but they're also going to charge more for, for niche stuff. And, you know, to, to reference back my old model, they're going to give away the head and they're going to sell the tail. And they're going to sell the tail, they're going to charge more for the tail because you understand what it is and you know why you want it and they're going to use the advertising model where the traffic is for, for, for the head. So I think freemium is probably the solution for, for the newspaper industry to use the games analogy. If, if any of you uh, have kids who play uh, Club Penguin, um, you know, Club Penguin is free to, pay, uh, to play, but if you want a pet for your penguin, you've got to subscribe or bug your parents for, for a credit card. You know, the question, you know, the question I, and I raised this with The Guardian in the UK last week is, what is, what is the pet for your penguin? You know, we the newspaper industry, we the media industry, we, 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 the, we the content industry, what is the thing that we can charge more for? Not resisting free, but finding something else above free that, that people value. I'm, I, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for thank you. Uh, Chris. wanted to express our appreciation again for all of you for coming. Uh, Chris, we appreciate your thought leadership and your insights. Uh, we believe that your book will be a great commercial success and a great thought leadership tool. It certainly has been very provocative and uh, we're thrilled that everyone came to uh, hear firsthand and uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of the evening and we appreciate Chris taking the time to come and be with us. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks all for coming.